Well, hello, David. Hi there. Thanks for joining the Business of Pharmacy podcast. Great to have you on. Thank you very much for having me. David, tell our listeners who you are and what's going on hot right now. My name is David Light. I'm the founder and CEO of an online pharmacy called Valisher. And uh, we're a very unique pharmacy, um, really the first pharmacy online or not, that is attached to an analytical laboratory. So we actually chemically analyze what's in medications and take samples from every single batch of every single medication that comes through our pharmacy. We screen out those that have problems and then deliver direct to patients uh, medications that come not just with our brand, but also with the certificate of analysis, very much like nutritional information. And, uh, you know, the reality and, and certainly what's getting a lot more visibility these days is that over 80% of our medications are manufactured in India and China. Uh, there's starting to be congressional hearings about this, a lot more visibility about these problems. Uh, certainly a lot of pharmacists, I'm sure, very well aware of all the recalls on, on Valsartan and Losartan and recently ranitidine uh, with uh, uh, you know, serious carcinogen problems uh, due to a variety of, of issues in the supply chain. And uh, our main focus at Valisher is that we actually check. We're, we're actually analyzing what's in those medications and, and trying to get the highest possible quality medications to our patients uh, and to the industry as a whole. So we're starting to work a lot more with, with hospitals and healthcare systems to, to plug in our, our core value and competency of quality assurance and medication. I bet the manufacturers never imagined there'd be someone on this side watching. Do you think they knew that? That's it's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think we're we're all on the same side here. If if, if manufacturers are producing quality products, then everything's great. Um, yeah. But um, you know, I, I think high level, really, one of the issues uh, that that's allowed all of these problems to come out is that this is a self-reported industry. Um, you know, just like you've seen all these, you know, very vividly with the airline industry. Uh, you know, the 737 MAX. And, yeah. uh, hey, when things go wrong with that kind of self-regulated industry, you have a plane explode. And right. And it's, it's extremely visible. But medications, uh, it's harder to see. Um, you know, they all kind of look the same, whether they yeah. have carcinogens in them or whether they're not dissolving properly or have the wrong dosage levels. These are all things that we check and we've found problems with. Um, so, again, it's less visible. But the problems have been there a long time, and we're, yeah. we're currently rejecting over 10% of the batches that we analyze. No kidding. Wow. When you say a batch, pharmacists, can they think of that as a lot number? Would that be a batch or? Exactly. It's synonymous. Yes. Okay. I imagine different manufacturers have different size lots. Is that like usually a day's production? They would name that a lot or would that be like an hour in every lot number or is that just across the board? So it can vary from manufacturer to manufacturer and product to product, but generally they're quite large. So at the manufacturer, um, they'll usually make millions of pills at a time in one lot. And usually the lot is when they're they're changing over uh, you know, starting materials that come in in very large quantities, um, gotcha. or changing over the machinery. Um, so it's it's it tends to be in a very large quantity, and then of course it goes. You know, drugs can go through ten, twenty different hands by the time they actually get to the pharmacy. Right. Um, so the lots could be split up uh, around the world. Whatever's in the big tank, kind of thing, right? Exactly, and it could take weeks or or even longer um, to to make that entire lot. Wow. If you get medicine in and then later you get the same lot in, let's say a week later, does that have to be tested too or do you have a way to record that and say, oh, that's lot one, two, three, four again. We tested that two weeks ago, so we're good. Actually, the the way that we're uh, functioning in our in our standard business model is actually being uh, buying large lots. Gotcha. Um, so we actually, uh, from a business perspective, actually function very differently than a lot of pharmacies. Yeah. In the sense that we take a lot of inventories, we'll buy sure. six months or sometimes even a year's worth of of inventory of right. certain drugs, um, so that we maintain a large lot 
And it's always in your site, and you only have to test it once because it's that same lot. Exactly. And, uh, you know, we, we've uh, developed a lot of our own proprietary analytics uh, to uh, reduce the costs in some of the most expensive uh, uh, areas of analyzing what's inside of a pill. Yeah. Uh, we also use a lot of industry standards, so things like carcinogen analysis. We follow FDA protocols. Uh, so we arguably have a really optimized business for, for the lowest cost but still highest sure. precision analysis, but still costs money, right? So people yeah. ask us all the time, well, h- how do you make any money doing this? Um, and uh, the the biggest bottom line is that we're buying these large lots. Uh, we add this analysis cost, but it amortizes over a large lot. So it's really yeah. you know, pennies or fractions of a penny per pill uh, yeah, of additional right. cost. The, you, you're not working like a regular pharmacy where you're test, you're buying two bottles and testing this each day kind of thing. Exactly. And, it, and it's a destructive test, right? So the pills yeah. are destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you never – everybody gets like – where most people get a 90-day supply, like you'd have to be sending out like 82-day supplies <laughs> and things like that because you, right. you had to use not eight of the tablets, you know? Exactly. And, and uh, you know, it also underscores the point that obviously we don't test every pill. Yeah. Because <laughs> then we'd have right. no pills. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's, that's essentially how it works. That's fascinating. All right, let's, let's back up in your life, David. I know you went to Yale. What was your degree there? And what, when did you start thinking as an 8-year-old or 10 or 12 or 15-year-old that you wanted to go in that direction? So what was your degree at Yale? So I studied molecular biology. Um, and uh, I was always very science-minded um, and I think entrepreneurial as well. Um, you know, back when I was... I think even in middle school, um, started uh, an eBay business uh, selling all sorts of scientific trinkets like neodymium iron boron magnets and, and elemental sodium um, and uh, definitely been a, a science nerd um, my whole life. And uh, I was really interested in chemistry um, and uh, biology as well as I got into to college and uh, molecular biology was kind of uh, the, the best of both worlds. Yeah. Um, and, and I think I, uh, I always really like the, you know, the, the practical application of this kind of science. So, right. you know, having a business around it or, or really impacting, uh, people's lives, uh, with it, um, you know, uh, obviously nothing wrong in being in academics or, or just studying it, but I really wanted to see it have the direct, uh, practical impact, uh, on humanity and on people. And uh, after uh, graduating from Yale, actually, I, I worked uh, primarily in the biotech industry um, and uh, a lot in, in DNA sequencing. Uh, I worked at a company called Ion Torrent, where we kind of had this idea that we would sequence DNA on a microchip. Um, and uh, we, we spent a fair amount of time and money um, uh uh, showing that our original concept that was based on an academic paper uh, was nonsense and was just noise, um, but uh, we we had a you know great support and great scientists and, and we actually figured out uh, and we had some, some good backup plans and it's now the number two DNA sequencing technology in the world. Wow! Um, and so uh, myself and actually one of the other original founders of Valisher, we were the chemistry department and uh, we invented a new particle that actually enabled uh, this system to, to function and uh, at a commercial level. And so I headed chemistry R&D, uh, it kind of developed the whole system around it. We had to you know, invent new manufacturing and, and QAQC systems and everything had to be done from scratch because uh, it was just so different than anything that was on there in the market. Uh, wow. But it worked. Wow. Define particle for me. Is that is that a combination of more than one different molecule or... Yeah, so it's like a really tiny uh, grain of sand. Um, you know, we were making these DNA binding particles that were like, a, you know, a micron size, so like the size of a bacteria or so. Wow. Um, and um, yeah, they were very difficult to work with, uh, but but they work really well. And um, as as all the the systems were were you know working and, and the science had come together and we'd launched and we were you know the fastest growing uh, sequencing company out there um, and we were purchased by Life Technologies and then Thermo Fisher Scientific and uh, I migrated to uh, a director of product management and, and more of the business side and really got an amazing experience at that company um, and 
then one day, a, a good friend of mine from Yale uh, called me up one day and was, was uh, telling me about all these problems he was having with his anticonvulsant medications. I mean, essentially, he'd refill it every month, and every once in a while, he'd have this month where he just felt terrible and had all these side effects and relapses sometimes, and he'd talk to his doctors, and his doctors would tell him, listen, there's a lot of variability out there, and, and generics are made all over the world, and mostly in India and China, and there's just nothing much we can do about it as doctors, nothing much your pharmacist can do, and it just kind of is what it is. So he obviously didn't like that answer and, and called me up, and we started to look into it from a technology perspective. Uh, you know, when you're a hammer, all the solutions look like nails, and uh, right. figured if we just develop a uh, you know, higher throughput, lower cost, uh, but really high accuracy system uh, that we could plug in to the end of the supply chain. I think our, our high-level idea was still that we should analyze – you know, in the United States, um, you know, trust but verify, like, great that the manufacturers there are, are analyzing. But, you know, when you read books like like Bottle of Lies that came out uh, this, uh, this year by Catherine Eben, I mean, the amount of fraud that can happen in these kinds of self-reported systems um, is, is massive. You know, you have companies like Rambaxi, they're almost entirely just fraudulent products that they never tested anything. Yeah. So, um Point is, let's actually test here. Um, you know, the, the FDA does as much inspections as it can, but it, it's not doing chemical testing uh, uh, very rarely. Sure. And so um, we developed that. So we spent a couple of years of our own time and money and effort, and um, we, we developed a spectroscopy-based approach. So it's specifically Raman spectroscopy um, that uh, essentially enables us to have all the advantages of lasers, which is really fast and easy and, and cheap to use. Um, but didn't used to have the accuracy that we needed, but we developed the accuracy components um, so we can analyze for things like dosage in a very high throughput, interchangeable way. I, of course, know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> but but for the but but for our listeners, the spectroscopy you're talking about shining light through something and and then seeing how the light distributes and the computer kind of reads that. Is that close? Yeah, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, okay. Your uh, uh, what you're scanning for or, or the information that you're getting back is is uh, the, the light changes depending on the molecular structure of what you're looking at. Um, and that's how you can actually, uh, usually you use that to identify molecules. Like, is this a malaria medication or is this a sugar pill? Um, and, and that's generally what these things are, are used for. But for us to be able to tell, well, is this, uh, you know, 80 milligrams of atorvastatin or is this actually 72, um, or, or 97, um, that kind of quantitative analysis uh, wasn't really possible. And so that's, we, we developed it, we, we filed the patents on it, we, we got ISO accreditation, so the International Organization for Standardization accredited not just our lab, but also the core technology. Um, and, you know, we were very proud of ourselves, and uh, we started talking to the big players in the industry uh, you know, pharmacies and distributors and, and you know, the, the folks that from a, a biotech background, that's kind of where you go and license mm -hmm. and kind of plug these things in. Yeah. And everybody basically told us the same thing, which was, yeah, you know, we, we, we know there's problems in the system and, uh, you know, it looks like the problems are even getting worse, um, but it's not our problem. So we, we got ISO certification uh, accreditation, actually, uh, not just our laboratory, but also the core technology itself. Uh, so really showing that very robust. And uh, we were very proud of ourselves. And, and we went and started talking to the industry, you know, the big, the big players in the field, the pharmacies and distributors. And, uh, you know, everybody kind of told us the same thing when we, when we approached them about adding quality assurance, you know, at the end of the supply chain, which was... Um, yeah, you know, we, we know there's problems out there and, and uh, quality issues are certainly seem to be getting worse, um, but it's not our problem. It's right. Always, it's always somebody else's problem. And, right. uh, you know, it's, it's such you – know, this is a $2 trillion global supply chain and there's always somebody else to point the finger at. Of course. And kind of nobody wanted to take any additional responsibility. Yeah. And uh, so at, at that point – and this is now starting into 2018 – 
uh, we decided that online pharmacy seems to be a big up and coming area, of course. And right. uh, you know, more recently, Amazon bought Pill Pack, and and uh, obviously a lot of movement in that space. Yeah. And so uh, we said, a that seems like a very interesting business to get into, but also b this would allow us to actually bring our core value of this quality assurance and medication just direct to the patients. Right. Um, and, and we were hearing, you know, more and more, and especially after we launched, we heard not just from patients, but also from doctors, um, you know, about the, their patients that complain all the time about generics, uh, having variability issues, not trusting their generics, and then the doctors are worried about adherence. And th they were basically the ones that taught us that we kind of created this new category of medication of a validated generic. You yeah. Know, you, you've had brand, which you know, a lot of people can't afford but trust, and now there's you know generics, which are over 90%, uh, that people can afford but you know, I'll, I'll more and more don't trust. Right but now that you have this this validated generic where we've chemically analyzed samples from every single batch, comes with these certificates of analysis. You know, very you wouldn't buy food without nutritional information on it. Right. Um, but yet your meds come in an orange bottle and says ten milligrams, and that's all you really know about it. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, that, and that's how we got to Valsure. And and I think the other thing uh, after launching, not only did we start hearing a lot from doctors, we we started to hear a lot from from hospitals. Um, from healthcare systems uh, that are really kind of directly connected to the patients and uh, you know concerned about the operations themselves, you know, having to deal with these huge recalls and, and all of these problems, yeah. and also obviously being very concerned about the the patients. Um, you know, the fact that you're you're hearing more and more from you know uh, key opinion leaders at the Cleveland Clinic that uh, they're they're having problems with. You know, medications for heart transplants and you know, really important things um, right. that uh, seem to have a lot of variability and, and not – doesn't seem like anybody's really doing that much about it. Um, right. So we were really uh, engaged to uh, to do something, you know, not yeah. just add more visibility. Right. Um, but actually offer – uh, a solution where we're really – all we're doing is trying to help ensure quality uh, by chemically testing and, and screening out those that, that have issues. And, uh, you know, it was when we added carcinogen analysis early this year because of all these Valsartan, Losartan right. recalls uh, that, that we started to see real problems there uh, that, that weren't yeah. being caught. Uh, yeah. we, we found a fourth major carcinogen in Valsartan and did an FDA citizen petition earlier uh, in the summer. And and then we, we saw all these problems with, with uh, ranitidine and, and Zantac and, and all the, the brand or generic products. Yeah. Um, that, that's obviously caught a lot of news recently. For our listeners, just a little bit of the history of how things would work in the pharmacy. You know, let's say a Mrs. Smith would come in and back in the day with insurances, this is going back to the early 80s, we could tell them, we'd say, well, this drug is for epilepsy or it's for your heartbeat or something. So the brand name is not necessarily better than the generic, but it's probably more consistent. So stay on that and you'll probably get more consistency there. However, as the insurances then stop covering the brand names, now you're going to the generics. And then we would tell people, well, at least stay on the same generic company. It might be more potent or less potent than the brand name drug, but at least it's going to be consistent. But now with the PBMs, the insurances really pressing on pricing, every pharmacy is really forced to buy the hopefully quality, but least expensive drug. And so now, even if a drug was chemically pure, it's all over the map on even just the percentage of the drug that has to be in the medicine, not to mention all the things that David just said about the carcinogens and every other thing that could be in there. Two or three years ago, I was really amazed when I looked up about drugs and it said if you have a drug that has so many milligrams it's allowed to be so many percent below that of the drug and so many percent above that of the drug yeah 
I was really floored by that range of how even a certified drug, the FDA is saying, ah, it's, you know, if it's, if it's 100 milligrams, it can be 95 or 107 or something like that. And that still passes. Can you yeah. comment on that? Sure. Are you guys looking at actual strength then too? You know, if you go into a, a Home Depot and you you buy a plastic six foot table, they'll say on the label there um, that that's plus or minus one percent. Yeah. Um, but most drugs uh, are allowed to be plus or minus ten percent. Ten percent. That's fascinating. Right. In a bad so, way to me. And, and you know, the the reality is that you could have, and we've looked at this, you know, you'll have one manufacturer that's low in that range, and then you have another manufacturer that's high in the range. Um, so it's really a, a 20% variability that's possible if they're following all the rules. Yeah. Right? And then obviously not everybody follows all the rules. We, we've found drugs, even really important neurotherapeutic, neurotherapeutic index drugs like levothyroxine, uh, thyroid medication yeah. uh, that's failed uh, the standard specs and are outside of it. Um, and by the way, once you add also dissolution, so how the pill dissolves in your body and gets sure. into the bloodstream, um, that's allowed to vary 45%. Oh my gosh. From one manufacturer to the next. So it can be minus 20 to plus 25 in blood levels. After dissolution. Right. Wow. And are you finding that the same manufacturer from lot to lot has different percentages or are those usually pretty close? Like, let's say it's 92 milligrams instead of 100. Is that consistent or are you finding that even from the same manufacturer that maybe the next time it's 103 milligrams? It's really hard uh, to tell uh, because honestly, uh, so sometimes, yeah, you do. You see a manufacturer at least uh, stay relatively in, in the same uh, you know ballpark uh -huh. and then you will see it Sometimes right, we also do inactive ingredient scans, yeah. and, and we'll see that you know, the, the sourcing of the material must have entirely changed, uh, it, and, and it could be from entirely different factories, right? The same product can be made in a variety of different places uh, under the same manufacturer. Um, so really, to, to do it right, it has to be done batch by batch, um, and you know, things that are, are very straightforward, like carcinogen levels, um, when we did our, our deep analysis of Valsartan... And we looked not just at the uh, NDMA, uh, nitrosodimethylamine, which has uh, been one of the key big uh, carcinogen problems, but NDMA, uh, it's uh, largely uh, theorized, uh, has, uh, in the case of Valsartan, was made by the switch to the solvent called DMF, uh, dimethylformamide, which itself is a carcinogen, uh, and actually a group 2 carcinogen, the same level of probably carcinogenic to humans um, that NDMA is. And so we said, you know what, let's be proactive and, and look for that too. And we found it in about two-thirds of all the batches we analyzed, uh, we found this carcinogen, um, including in the brand. Wow. Uh, the, the brand was, was lower uh, than, than some of the generics uh, that were much higher that, that we analyzed. Point is, you really got to check everything. You know, brand is not a guarantee of, of absolute quality. Zantac as well. We, we looked at the Zantac, we looked at the generics, and we found problems all around. Um, but point was that when we looked at this deep dive in Valsartan, um, you know, there's some manufacturers that were totally clean and, and were great. And then we, we tested another batch or even just a combination product of, of you know, Valsartan, like hydrochlorothiazide. Uh, and then it failed completely. Like it had really high levels of, of the dimethylformide and even NDMA. We found a batch that, that was failing even the FDA spec on, on the, the known and well-studied carcinogen. That's fascinating. L let me use the drug strength as the example again. Let's say your limit is 10%, but you find it at 8% off. Do you then pass that along to the consumer or do you just have basically a green light red light kind of thing because even as a pharmacist if you sent something to me and said this is supposed to be a hundred milligrams but it's 92 milligrams <laughs> and it's okay <laughs> i would say wait a minute you guys didn't right. do your job even though you did because the fda allows that how do you go about that are you just saying yes this is okay? You're not giving all the data, I imagine? Well, also, we're not trying to uh, you know, to scare people or make them uncomfortable with their medications. And, and I think you're, you're, you're right that 
uh, probably the average American consumer is assuming that when it says 100 milligrams, it's 100.000 <laughs> yeah. milligrams. <laughs> right, yeah. And, and you know, to be fair, uh, and, and coming from the sciences and, and sure. you know, manufacturing uh, of, of biotech device world, yeah, um, it, it's never going to be perfect. No, right. Um, and, you know, we, we would love for the FDA and, and the USP to, to get tighter, yeah. uh, especially in certain products where, where it really is. Where it matters, it's more. obvious yeah. that it makes a difference. Right, but you know, ultimately, uh, we we are kind of uh, uh, it's either red or it's green. Uh, we do try and and find manufacturers that are also more as as consistent as we can get. Um, but we don't make drugs, right? At right. Um So we're beholden to whatever's out there, and and obviously we people need their meds. Yeah. Um, so you know, if if things are failing, we we don't care. We've had situations where we just weren't able to find a particular med that was passing. Um, but usually we do. Yeah. Um, and, and we make sure that it's at the very least within the, the prescribed, you know, United States pharmacopoeia bounds, you know, sure. the monographs, um, or the FDA standards. They might say this drug is allowed to have so much of not just the chemical strength, but so much of X, but no more than X, whether that's the filler or whatever. And you're making sure that it's in those ranges. Right, exactly. And like disillusion, um, you know, they, they might say extend release, but when you actually look at, at the the monographs, they might say between 12 and 15 hours or, right. um, you know, or, or sometimes even, um, you know, uh, more broad than that or, you know, and we, we follow and make sure that they're at least following that. And actually on, on the subject of the pill coming apart, one thing that we do – you know, as as scientists, is is we do make sure to test medications in conditions that are uh, kind of real world conditions. Right. So actually looking at at uh, conditions of what would be in your stomach, uh, what would be in your intestinal fluid. Right. And, and there are industry standards around this, uh, and and academic standards. But uh, unfortunately, some of the problems that we see uh, a fair amount in disillusion is that um, the drug companies themselves are allowed to register whatever rules they want mm. in how to even analyze for a drug uh, uh, dissolving. Yeah. And uh, which, which is very odd yeah. uh, to us. Um, and, and usually they're, they're reasonable tests. But uh, there are situations like, for example, with lamotrigine that, that we've done uh, a deeper study on and there's a number of these drugs that we really de- delve into – um, where the USP registered monograph for how, you know, for, for essentially the way this works is you have a beaker um, with solution um, that uh, that is similar to your stomach, like a, you know, acidic pH. And sure. Then when it goes into intestine. With me, you'd have a lot of ice cream and <laughs> yeah. pecans and yeah. things like that in there too. That's part of the reality of doing a lab <laughs> test is you can't perfectly recreate yeah, right, uh, right. all the pecans yes, and, and yes, the hot yes. dogs and, yeah. and those kinds of things. But, you know, at the very least, you, you have the major products and, and the right pH. Um, sure. And uh, so usually you start at a pH of uh, 1.2 or 2 for the stomach, which is a very acidic pH. And then the intestine is usually about a pH of 6.8. Um and you know reasonable salt concentrations mm-hmm. and and you basically have a pill and a paddle in there and a paddle kind of spins around sure and and you uh, measure samples from this beaker uh, over time to see how the the pill is dissolving and the drug yeah. is getting into the solution so yeah. that's kind of how it works all the conditions in that beaker can actually be determined by the drug companies who develop the drug and so you have situations like lamotrigine which is a really important anticonvulsant yeah. uh, anti epileptic drug. Also, an antidepressant. The solution is uh, supposed to be a pH of twelve, which uh, drain cleaner is a pH of eleven. Mm. So this is like super extra strength drain cleaner, yeah. uh, pH wise. And there's enough ionic surfactant or soap in there to kill five rats. Wow. Um, so you know, you have this solution uh, that dissolves the pill very well. It could also dissolve your hand. Yeah. Right. Um, but it's. Uh, at least in our view, not a very good metric for how it would actually dissolve in your body. Yeah, right. It's like if a pill had to be, whatever, crushed somehow or something, and they say, well, we ran over it with a tank. It's like, well, yeah, but we need to, <laughs> right. we need it to be chewable or something like that. Precisely. In our laboratory, um, we follow these 
standard, you know, industry standards of, of what a human stomach would be, what a, a, a human intestines would be. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in, in some of these cases, when we test it in these real world conditions, you get very different results. Right. Um, and, and we uh, oftentimes screen out products that way as well. Um, so, you know, they may not have you know the red green you talked about. Yeah. Um, maybe that would have been a green. Yeah. Um, if you would have you know essentially tested it in drain cleaner. Yeah. Um, but when we test it in in physiologically relevant and in real world conditions and and we get a red. Yeah. Uh, we still screen that out. I was listening to an interview that you um, were on, and in fact, you've got like what you would say is a hundred point inspection. You're you're testing a ton of stuff on every medicine. Right. Exactly. We we test multiple different carcinogens, um, and you know different medications have different tests that that they get. I mean, yeah. Obviously, it wouldn't make much sense to do dissolution analysis and eye drops. Sure. Right. Um, right. And uh, we, we we have a lot of our core products, you know, high volume products that we do really deep analysis on. Uh, but you know, certain analyses like dosage, like dissolution, are really calibrated to the drug itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, with a lot of our proprietary technology, we, we can do these kinds of calibrations in, in a day or two, but still takes a whole day of calibrating just to that drug. Mm. So we're, we're slower in, in adding more and more drugs, and we have about 100 drug products or so that we do the, the very deep analysis on. Other analyses like carcinogens analysis, um, we have to calibrate for the carcinogens. Yeah. So we have about seven carcinogens right now that, that we analyze for for every batch of, of every medication. Um, but that we don't have to tailor to the actual drug. Gotcha. So we have over 2,000 drug products that we can at the very least you know, have this safety screen of analyzing for those carcinogens. And, and that's how we, we found the problems with, with Zantac and ranitidine. Carcinogens. I'm imagining there's millions of carcinogens. And if you guys are doing seven, you're doing the ones that somehow seem to sneak their way into manufacturing plants. It's either the metal that a lot of these plants use or some other thing. Is, is that correct? No, you're right. Uh, there are... Yeah, you know, the very least thousands of known carcinogens, um, and uh, it, it would be almost impossible to actually uh, analyze for every single possible thing that could go wrong yeah. in the medication. Um, and and you know we we want to be very transparent about that. You know when sure. you have medication for us, it's not an absolute guarantee that everything right. possible was ever checked. A lot more than zero. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and and the 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 point is that you can be smart about these things. You can sure. take educated guesses about what to look for. What what are bigger problems? What are kind of known manufacturing problems? Yeah, right. Um, you know, specifically these nitrosamine carcinogens, so NDMA, NDEA, that you start to hear a lot about. Yeah. And the blood pressure meds. Uh, the problem with Zantac and ranitidine was NDMA again. Um, these this class of carcinogen uh, called nitrosamines has been well studied since the 1950s. Yeah, uh, it's one of the most potent carcinogens on the planet, um, and uh, one of the best studied ones there are. Yeah, and you know people sometimes get hung up on on the concept that it's it's described as a probable human carcinogen, um, and so does, doesn't that mean that it's not so bad? Um, but the only reason that it's a probable human carcinogen is you can't have a study where you actually give people a carcinogen and then try and see what kind of cancer yeah, they right, get. Yeah, right, right. Obviously, that would not be an ethical study to have. Right. So uh, they do the studies on animals. And in the animals, it's extremely clear. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, uh, NDMA is actually used as a control to induce cancer in clinical studies on, on rats. You know, if you want to be sure that a rat is going to get cancer, you do that. You give it NDMA. Is the NDMA in hot dogs? So there is NDMA at, at very low levels in a variety of places. Is that the place where you'll see, like, if something says no nitrates, like on the front of a hot dog thing, are nitrates NDMA or, or is that too broad of a brush? Now, that's actually, uh, uh, it touches on a really important point, um, is uh, uh, nitrates or, or also nitrites. Nitrites, I'm uh, sorry. W- w- yeah. Which, um, uh, if you look at a hot dog uh, um, package, yeah. um, a lot of them, if you look at the ingredients, you'll see sodium nitrite. Right, right. Uh, and it's, it's an additive. 
uh, they put in there. It's for flavor and coloring and, and to make it taste better and longer life and all that stuff. Right. A, a really important point related to, to Zantac and ranitidine, and this has been discussed, um, is that there's actually uh, about 50 years, five decades of research that are looking at nitrites in your stomach uh, that react with certain drugs. Hmm. Um, and uh, this has you know, been a really big area of, of academic research uh, in you know paper, you know journals like Nature and and The Lancet and you know really serious you know, big scientific publications yeah. for for decades. Um, and actually, in in 1979, uh, there was a drug called methapyrrolene that uh, was a, a histamine blocker, an over the counter drug. Um, it uh, had an unstable DMA group, a dimethylamine group, on the, on the molecule itself uh, that was suspected and through a, a lot of studies to react with nitrite gotcha. in your stomach gotcha. and then form NDMA. So nitrite is, is like the N, right? It, it's, it's the N of the NDMA. I see. And so you could have the DMA on the drug and then if you're eating nitrite- I gotcha. Um, then those two can combine and form NDMA I gotcha. in your stomach. This was the reason uh, all this carcinog uh, carcinogen uh, worries uh, caused this drug methapyrrolene to be recalled. And that drug was out for 25 years. It was over the counter. I see. Uh, you know, the FDA, the National Cancer Institute, and all over the world and industry recalled this drug um, because of very similar problems of exactly what's happening in, in ranitidine. I see. And ranitidine, or the, which is the active ingredient of, of Zantac, um, has not just a DMA on the molecule, which can react with nitrite in your stomach. Yeah. It also has a nitrite. It has an N on the molecule as well. Oh, I see. Gotcha. And, and a lot of the initial data that we looked at that we put in our FDA citizen petition was that uh, at at you know standard analysis temperatures, which are higher than body temperature, yeah. but these are really standard for for analysis uh, in the laboratory. Um, the the drug was actually reacting with itself. Wow! So it it was able to you know certainly in the stomach is concerning, um, right? But the fact that the molecule is so unstable yeah. that it can react with itself within minutes right and form you know not just you know low levels of NDMA but millions and millions of nanograms so the, the FDA limit for NDMA is 96 nanograms per day okay and, and we were detecting millions in, in in the detectors the hot dog itself they even call some of the hot dogs carcinogens but not because of the nitrites necessarily. Yeah. So uh, also important to differentiate that there are, you know, cured meats, uh, even in very low levels in water sometimes, um, you can find NDMA, the carcinogen itself. So nitrite by itself is not necessarily carcinogenic, um, but when it combines with the NDMA- Or the DMA. Uh, sorry, when it combines with the DMA- That's the last time I'm going to correct you. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Do I have to do, a, yes. do, have to do everything bad. around here, David? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, yes, I'm, I'm yes. glad you're listening. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and by the way, this is actually a pretty relevant and important, um, you know, getting down into the weeds here. Yeah. Because uh, the, the, there's- uh, you know, actually, uh, statements that came from the FDA recently about uh, analyzing uh, stomach conditions, and and they claimed that they didn't find any NDMA being formed uh, with uh, ranitidine and and you know hmm. Zantac products, um, but it seems that they didn't add any nitrite, so they just had acid and and salt, you know, the, the simulated gastric fluid standard. Uh, which, especially in this case, is is just not a representation of a real world stomach. Would you have to add it though, be, because the ranitidine, if it already has the N there, would you have to add it, or when you do add it, it even does it more? Um, so certainly, when you add it, it does it more. Gotcha. Uh, when you have just the free nitrite. Gotcha. And, and that's what we saw as well. I see. Is that when you're in the in the very simplistic stomach condition, so you can't 
just like you said before, like we, we can't test uh, with pecans in there and hot <laughs> yeah. dogs and yeah. everything else. And we don't know what you're going to eat versus your neighbor. But nitrates are in everything. And Correct. so you always have it in the stomach usually. And, and, and even if you didn't eat anything with nitrite in it, you're going to have nitrite in your stomach. It's always present in your stomach. It's always present in your blood. Nitrite is, is also getting manufactured uh, in your body by bacteria in your saliva, oh, by bacteria. And ironically... Um, you know, when you when you take an antacid, it's often because you've eaten foods particularly high in nitrite, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, you've had your pepperoni pizza and that kind of stuff. Hot dogs and everything else. Yeah. And the act, uh, it's also very well known in, in, in the scientific literature that the act of taking an, an antacid uh, dramatically increases the growth of bacteria <laughs> that form nitrite. No kidding. Isn't that something? Like we look, we can we can argue all day about what is the appropriate amount of nitrite that we should be testing. Right. Um, you know, our 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 levels that we used was very similar to a recent clinical study in at Stanford University, uh, which is actually yeah. also very similar to what the World Health Organization um, actually suggested back in their global summit on nitrites, nitrates, and nitrosamines in 1978. Okay. Um, but you know, we, we can debate what the right levels are, but they're definitely not zero. Yeah, right. right. They're absolutely not zero uh, right. for practically anyone. And, yeah. uh, and we did show the tests even in our own citizen petition um, where if you don't have any nitrites, it's very difficult to detect the NDMA formation. And we, we didn't detect any. Uh, in the stomach conditions. You might still gotcha. be forming it in the body and you might yes. still be forming it by enzymes that are in your stomach and everything right. else, which are almost right. impossible to replicate. Um, yeah. But you have to put some nitrite uh, in there uh, in order to test yeah. it properly. They're creating their own false condition. Yeah. So at the very least, th these are very different conditions than what's been used for 50 years uh, by academic researchers. Um, yeah. So we, we still very much believe that the NDMA carcinogen is being formed in the human stomach at alarmingly high levels uh, with uh, any uh, ranitidine. So whether it's Zantac or any other manufacturer, uh, generic or or and it doesn't matter if it's in a pill or a syrup or any form. Um, we think there's a very high danger of this forming high levels of NDMA in your stomach and potentially even higher levels of NDMA once it goes out of your stomach throughout your body. I mean, you have you know these enzymes that are these you know micro reactors, these chemical reactors throughout yeah. your body. Um, you have you have thousands and thousands of different kinds of these, and when you have yeah. a molecule that's just so inherently unstable, right. um, that it could even be reacting with itself, uh, yeah. let alone anything else in your body. With the NDMA re reacting right with itself, I exactly. And it, it's not just that it's degrading; it's reacting and then directly forming one of the most potent carcinogens on the planet. We're not just chasing down anything here. I think you said that if you have a rat that you need to get cancer because you have to study something else, how would whatever the cancer does to them, you're giving NDMA. Was that right? That's correct. It's Fascinating. It's used in clinical studies to induce cancer in rats. It's like if we want that rat to get cancer, we're not going to have them puff on a cigarette. We're not going to have them, <laughs> you know, eat – eat. Uh, Bunch of bacon, a bunch of or bacon <laughs> or hot dogs. We're going to give them NDMA to make sure they get cancer, or else we're all going to get fired because the rats don't get cancer. Right, and you're going to have uh, a, a weak study because you need a control where you know the can the rat's going to get cancer. Theranos certainly. That whole story. I don't think that was the subject of the book you mentioned earlier. Theranos was certainly definitely an example of fraud. An example of fraud. How do you get across that? You guys aren't Theranos. Yeah, and uh, obviously very aware of, of Theranos and, and all the terrible and deceptive things that they yeah. did. And, and I do want to clarify that you know the book that I mentioned, Bottle of Lies by Catherine Eben, that's uh, about the, the fraud in the generic drug industry gotcha. And, gotcha. and making up um, you know analytical reports oh, and things like thank that. Thank you. Uh, kind of similar to Theranos, <laughs> actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Point is that uh, we we differentiate ourselves in, in many ways from that. Um, you know, even our, our proprietary technology 
Um, you know, it wasn't just us saying that it works. We we voluntarily brought the International Organization for Standardization. You're inviting them to breathe down your neck. <laughs> exactly, which 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 is. Which is days of audits, yeah, right, right? And, and going through all the details, not just of the laboratory system, but but the analysis itself, and and how robust and consistent it is, right? Um, and then on top of that, as as we add more and more tests to what we do, we also use industry standard. You know, the the tests that we analyzed ranitidine with. Uh, was the FDA standard at the time? Yeah, um, and and a standard technology. So gas chromatography, mass spectrometry has been around for decades. Yeah, right. Gotcha. Um, and and we're also ISO accredited, the International Organization for Standardization, on those particular tests as well. Like we we really know how to run those. Right. And I think lastly, you know, the fact that um, what we're doing is getting so much impact and recognition. Right. Um, you know, we, we're, we're obviously having some scientific debate with, with the FDA over conditions and, and things like that. But the bottom line is that there's recalls now all over the world and they yeah. confirm that NDMA is there and it shouldn't be. Yeah. Um, and, and again, like, you know, we, we feel that this is a much more serious problem of inherent instability of the drug. Yeah, exactly. And all lots are affected. Exactly. Um, and we're still debating that, um, obviously. But Look, you have four days after the FDA's statement, you had Health Canada come out, right? Um, and 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 uh, ban ranitidine altogether. Yeah, right. Throughout Canada, it was just banned, and they said in the second line of of their statement, they said current evidence suggests that NDMA may be present in ranitidine regardless of the manufacturer. Wow, as in it's an inherent problem. Yeah, and then about forty other countries followed. All right, so you know Germany, France, Italy, uh, Saudi Arabia, you know Pakistan. Pakistan wow. not only banned ranitidine entirely, uh, they also banned the manufacturing of ranitidine in Pakistan. Um, Taiwan instituted fines for any pharmacy that still has ranitidine products on their shelves. You know, Korea released some of their data and they were finding over 300 times the permissible levels wow. of NDMA just as a contamination, not even in the in the body. You know, we're we're very concerned about even higher levels in the body. Wow. But long story short, um, to answer your question, uh, I think the validity of the science that we do and its importance are, are being borne out by by many organizations uh, that are that are serious organizations and, and regulators now all over the world. You're not just going to put on a black turtleneck and lower your voice to show your uh, <laughs> to show your authority, Correct. right? Yeah, I threw away all the turtlenecks. <laughs> Do you guys come across any just counterfeits? You know, we do an inactive ingredient scan as well, where where we uh, at least theorize that we might find counterfeits. Because, I mean, a counterfeit could have the right drug in there, right? We're looking for the drug. Yeah. Um, We're looking for, you know, carcinogens. Maybe they made it cleanly. Um, But it's very likely that the inactive ingredients, uh, which tend to be proprietary formulations, um, would be done wrong. And so we also scan for the inactive ingredients. And we have found actually products where the inactive ingredients were, were incorrect. Um, now, could that have been a manufacturer mistake? Uh, possibly. Um, or it could have been a counterfeit. Have you found any where just the drug itself is not in there? Um, we we have found uh, before where, where the, the drug component was wrong. Wrong. Just the wrong drug, like maybe a mix-up. Uh, right. Or, or like actually what, what we specifically found was the salts were wrong. Gotcha. Right? So you might have a drug that's a hydrochloride. Yeah. Um, and then in reality, it was hydrobromide. Yeah. Or, you know, you could have a succinate, like, you know, metoprolol succinate versus tartrate. Yeah. You know, and and so um, we have found instances where the counter ion, the salt, was wrong. Yeah. And for our listeners, the ones you mentioned have a lot to do with how long it's going to be released in the body. Correct. So if you've got a heart medicine and you think it's going to release over 24 hours, but it releases over two hours, you've got some potential issues there. Exactly. Um, and, and those are technically different products, right? The, the, yeah. The, um, you know, the, the counter yeah. and the, the other half of the drug um, is, is part of the overall drug's function many times. Yeah. 
About five years ago, we actually had a counterfeit drug. One of the pharmacists, well, we never had the drug tested, but one of the pharmacists called me and said, I opened up this bottle of this drug and it was the wrong color tablet and the wrong mm. milligram. We looked at some other sealed bottles and they were actually the different strength in there. And my guess is they were counterfeit and the FBI and so on got involved. And um, that was about the last we heard of it, but they're they're out there, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, and there's been a lot of attention to counterfeits uh, in, in you know, a number of years uh, now in, in the media and, and uh, you know, the World Health Organization is quite concerned about it. Um, but I think one of the things that we've really been seeing is that just because it's authentic doesn't mean it's good either. Um, yeah. You know, these, uh, you know, all, all, all the ranitidine tablets are authentically made and, and, you know, made in the right factories. Right. Um, but, you know, hey, sometimes these factories have very serious problems like uh, the, you know, all these issues with Valsartan and, and Losartan and Herbsartan are really due to just poor manufacturing practices. Um, and, uh, you know, Zantac and Renidine seems to be a, a totally different problem of, of the drug itself. But point is, this all boils down to the same need for additional quality assurance here in the United States, independent testing, you know, testing that isn't part of the standard yes. regulatory pharma world. Right, um, which I'd, I'd like to think does as as good of a job as it can, and and you know yeah. is just trying to produce uh, high quality products. But right. look, everybody makes mistakes. Yeah, um, and and there's no doubt that there's also some bad actors there. Um, yeah, especially with so much manufacturing being overseas. Yeah, um, that really we need to be testing here in the United States independently and chemical testing on every batch. Is the NDMA the tip of the iceberg for all kinds of stuff that's going to start coming out? Or is ranitidine like a special focus? Or is this like a cascade of now all kinds of stuff like this? I mean, you, you don't know what you don't know. Um, right. But uh, I, I will say that we're a small company. You know, we, we just launched this thing a year ago. Yeah. Um, and we're just tripping over these problems. And, and yeah. we... we um, we, we're finding more issues than we have resources to fully investigate. Yeah. Um, and you know, we we don't release these studies, you know, publicly until we have a lot of the data. You know, we know the impact. We we don't want to scare people for no reason. Um, right. And and we we want to make sure that the science is done absolutely. You know, uh, that we have super high confidence in in what we release. Um, right. And, you know, repeat the studies, have, have external folks repeat them and, and, and that right. kind of thing. And, um, but uh, I can definitely say that uh, it's a lot of issues out there, uh, some yeah. bigger than others. And yeah. um, I, I would predict that uh, this is not the last that we're going to see. The last we're going to see. <laughs> All right, David, here is the big question that's been building up inside of me through the interview here. Sure. There. There's this problem out there, and you guys have found a great solution for it. Other people can do things like put the medicine in a bottle and put stamps on the packages and things like that. I'd imagine at some point, and I'm sure a million times it's been through your head, that your company becomes the good housekeeping seal of approval and you're making money on that through all the pharmacies who everybody says, well, I'm not going to use that if there's not the Valisure seal of approval on it. When do you or do you at some point switch that where you're the you're the approval the world is looking for versus a drug from you going somewhere? Uh, it's an excellent question, and I think the uh, you know, high level, what we're really interested in and what we're really good at uh, is that quality assurance. Of course. Right? And uh, plugging that in to other pharmacies, to other healthcare systems, um, uh, and, and that could be through a variety of different ways. You know, maybe that's you know, wholesale and a few key drugs for now. Yeah, um, right. Or, or you know, a lot of hospitals have talked to us about you know access to the data. Um, yeah. You know the uh, all the data and and what we're 
rejecting and why yeah because they might say well you know this rejects so many percent of the time hey let's just stay away from it we can buy it from company a why why go with b that david has found a problem a lot of the time right and and look they don't want that on their shelves either right yeah right um, right and so you know we're, we're working with a number of of new partners and and experts yeah. in these fields um you know data scientists and you know how how can we get uh, uh, as much as possible, the core value of what we do yes. to to plug into others, and you know maybe yes. one day, um, you know what you describe might might really be possible is to plug this into manufacturers and, and distributors and just uh, really have this done consistently. Um, uh, but until we get there, and, and there's a lot of hurdles to doing that, right? And I think yeah. and I think well, part of the the difficulty here is the, that we're finding is that you really have to do this batch by batch. You know, maybe we can yeah, aggregate right. some of the data yeah. um, and, and get a good feel for, for areas to avoid or to improve. Yeah, but it's batch by batch. It really needs to be batch by batch. Um, so, you know, we, we still feel that our, our primary pharmacy component is really important for what we, we do in general. Uh, however, at the same time, getting as much of that value as we can to others, yeah. uh, you know, perhaps through a few key drugs – or perhaps through data um, where we maybe add some quality scores. You know, that the FDA has actually uh, made an announcement where they want to have um, uh, scores, different scores for different manufacturers oh, um, right. based on uh, their, their, their quality system maturity. Um, yeah. So essentially how much paperwork they've done. Um, right. and, and how long they've been, you know, part of these quality management systems. We're not interested in, um, a, a lot of paperwork for, just for the sake of, of paperwork. No, yeah. You know, we, we think that you have to chemically analyze it. People can have a stack of paper, but if it's not looking for the right stuff, exactly. or like we talked about the other company, if it's exactly. not using the right landscape of what your body really is. The right condition. The right condition. If it's not testing that, it's not really passing it then. R right, exactly. So I think we, we can start aggregating this into quality scores and you know, yeah. things like that. Um, and we're, we're very interested in working with hospitals, with healthcare systems. Yeah, kind of a consumer reports kind of thing almost. Right, right. So I think that there's many ways that we can start to really infuse the, the grander value of the quality assurance uh, that we do um, uh, in, into the system to touch more patients and, and get closer to this grand vision of everything is tested independently yeah if i may be my own devil's advocate to my devil's advocate <laughs> i would imagine too that part of the value you guys have is once you've captured a lot you've tested it you have your eyes on it now it hasn't gone out to another all sailor who could switch something or have it on a shelf too long you know whatever i mean it's like right when you test something when you give it your approval the next step is the customer. It's not another eight steps going through possible fraud things and all that kind of stuff. That's number one. And number two is I guess that one thing you can prove through all this is your proof of concept, I guess, of what the desire or demand is for your prescriptions. Right. And your your first point there touches on, uh, I think, uh, an excerpt that you, that when we were first starting to talk about this 100-point inspection concept. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And there, there's a lot of parallels between you know, the medication you're going to pick up at a pharmacy to a used car, right? I mean, yeah. the, the reality is that it's, it's touched 10, 20 different hands. It's got thousands yeah. of miles on it. It's been all over the world. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it's probably a few years old. Um, yeah, right. And, and so really you're buying a used car. But then they say just granny had it in her garage for 15 years. Right. If you're buying a used car, you're not going to be like, oh, well, you know, the Volkswagen tested it in the plant somewhere, right? You, yeah. You want a 100-point right. inspection on that car that you're going to be buying. Um, yeah, right. And, and that really speaks to your point of of you have to test it before the consumer is going to get it or, or shortly before, which is at the 
end of this whole supply chain. Yeah. Um, which which is is not an easy thing to do, and uh, obviously adds a lot of yeah. You know the the stress on the pharmacy. You know we we have yeah. uh, a lot of work that we do in our own pharmacy. Yeah, I imagine. You know the bottom line is that uh, we we are working towards systems and efficiencies to to plug this in and make it as easy as possible for other pharmacists or other healthcare practitioners to be able to use this value. Yeah. But like you say, with the car analogy, that's absolutely right. Because if you were to test it not until the end, then it's like testing a car out, but then giving it to a teenager to drive around for two years and <laughs> right. never never put oil in it and have the engine burn out. I'm not, right. not that I'm angry at my kids for any of that. Uh, <laughs> never happened, I'm sure. Never happened. But yeah, you, you got to be close to that end product or else your value has lost its approval if, if you have other hands, you know, touching it in the, in the final process of things. Exactly. And, uh, and that's why it has to be really towards the end of the chain, um, you know, at the, at the buy time uh, for that, for that patient, for that customer, uh, and and batch to batch, you know, it's yeah. Like just because you know th this one model of car worked out well right. for you doesn't mean that the everything else that that manufacturer's ever made is perfect. Yeah. Oh, I thought another way to be a devil's advocate. Perfect. All right, here we go. You guys being mail order to people, you hear about it's in the heat of the postal truck for the day, or it's. 23 degrees in the mailbox for two hours before the customer gets it. Do you guys have anything like that to refute those claims that a typical brick and mortar pharmacy would use against mail order? It is an important point and we are aware and, and uh, concerned about it. And I think one of the uh, important differentiations and also what we decide to ship or not is we don't do cold chain shipping. So, you know, mm. drugs that are uh, classified as being unstable or as mm -hmm. needing very tight tolerances um, or, or, you know, these very specific temperatures, uh, we don't have on our, on our formulary. Gotcha. Um, and, and honestly, you know, some of these drugs like, like ranitidine, that we're not classified that way, but yeah. you know we discovered we're very unstable. Heat or cold could do some of those. Exactly, you know, a hot car could have very easily led to you know ranitidine reacting with itself. I never use those excuses. I don't know if I believed them for or if it was just brick and mortar pharmacists using it as a way to try to scare people a little bit. But I guess, like you say, sometimes the heat, you know can do some things to that. Right. And, and look, there is, you know, as obviously you know, in, in pharmacy, there is a differentiation between drugs you have to keep in a fridge. Yeah, right. Um, uh, versus one that could sit on the shelf. Right. Um, and uh, look, these shipping companies are supposed to adhere to uh, their own standards yeah. as well. Yeah, right. Um, so, you know, we, we, we are definitely aware of it, and, and that's a, a big reason why we, we don't do some of these really sensitive drugs through mail order. Um, but uh, we not only do, obviously, the standard uh, shipping that any other mail order pharmacy does, but uh, unlike any other pharmacies, we actually are doing kind of inadvertently some of the stability <laughs> testing. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, through carcinogen analysis and others. Um, and then uh, certainly at least once have, have found a serious concern, yeah. um, you know, on the, on the ranitidine side. Yeah. D David, if someone said to you that you're no longer allowed to do drugs, you, you can't take this road anymore. Are there other holes in the marketplace that can use testing like this in your mind? Like if someone said, absolutely no more drugs, we can't do that. What, what other areas could your business do if it if it had to certainly um you know we we get asked a lot um about about supplements i mean obviously we do supplements in in our pharmacy okay. as well sure um we we get asked a lot um about you know, cbd and marijuana i think this whole area yeah. has has really big hole in in yeah. regulation over it sure you know, for a lot of reasons and you have you know various states doing different things and obviously the right. federal government still very much anti most of that field um, yeah. so at Valisher we uh, were very take very seriously playing you know very much outside of any gray areas you know we dot yeah. our I's and cross our T's and everything we do yeah. you know legally 
Um, and so and we have DEA licenses, you know, so we, we, right. uh, um, we, we don't participate in that field now, you know, eventually one day, hopefully it'll, it'll be, uh, legalized and, and then we can get into that. But I think even beyond that, you know, there, there's a report recently about heavy metals in, in baby food. Interesting. Right. Food. Yeah. Baby products in general. Um, they have, there's a lot of concern over heavy metals in the plastics, BPA in plastics. Something that kids might be munching on or in, in contact with or something like that. So not even internal stuff, right? No, exactly. You know, hey, I got four kids um, and they, they go through a lot of toys and uh, I don't know yeah. where they're all from and I, I don't know how well they were made right um and we go through a lot of baby food and formula yeah. and all those kinds of things exactly so i uh, definitely think there's a lot of areas for expansion of of the core value of independent analysis at the end of the supply chain that's right what's your least favorite part of your day in your last couple of years like what day do you wake up and say crap it's it's wednesday i gotta do this this week do you have something you don't like um you know being so steeped in the, in the healthcare system now which was i was an outsider right we were biotech yeah. scientists uh yeah, yeah right even in the business of science is you know, very different than yeah uh, you know the the ins and outs of healthcare. Right. I have to admit the uh, the complexity and, and and convoluted nature of this system is something that I, I definitely do not like. The financial part or the FDA drug part? Uh, no, I'd say the um, the the nuances of getting a patient a prescription, going through PBMs. Oh, oh, jeez! You know, <laughs> <laughs> you just. You uh, just made me want to go have a bowl of ice cream now. And so with some pecans. Yeah. At least, try and uh, avoid the nightmare. Uh, yeah, right. Um, but yeah, no, seriously, oh. I, I had no idea what a PBM was before getting into this business. Oh. And, you know, the uh, the fact that they exist and that there's these massive multi-billion dollar organizations that, you know, we as you know, a pharmacy have to contract with but then are directly competing against. Yeah. At the same time, like, I don't even understand how that's legal. Well, David, that's why I said I was devil's advocate. I was actually being a friend. I was trying no. to say, leave, go. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's tough. Thanks. It's tough. Uh, it, it, it is tough. But you know what? I think that's also where there's tremendous opportunity. Absolutely. And it, it's it's a system that, you know, when you, especially when you talk to professionals, but even more and more now, just individual average patients. You know, everybody agrees healthcare is broken. You're bringing trust into a industry that inherently nobody trusts anybody anymore. You found that hole. And I didn't even realize that, right? Yeah, you haven't. Even, <laughs> you didn't even realize that. And I think you're you're right. Is is one of our core values of of transparency, um, and and you know quality through the transparency of what we do. Yeah. Um, it, we knew that it was needed. Yeah. Um, you know, when starting Balisher, but right. we definitely, I don't think we we fully grasp just how needed it is, uh, how difficult it would be to really infuse it into the system. Exactly. How many how many barriers there are uh, to really innovating and changing this system? Right. There is a growing wave of momentum here that uh, the system needs to change yeah. in a lot of ways, yeah. right? Like, obviously, quality assurance and medication is what we're focused on, but there's yeah. been a lot of talk about PBMs and, and all the problems there, about drug pricing in general, right. about drug reimportation from yeah. other countries. Yeah. Uh, I think there's all sorts of potential solutions and all sorts of, of issues that need to be tackled. Um, and, uh, and it's hard. All of them are hard. Yeah, <laughs> but you're onto that with trust and transparency, I think so. I absolutely agree. And and I think especially in, you know, first and foremost is safety, right? Safety and yeah. quality yeah. Of, of your medications, which are so critical to your health. And, and look, the, the, the whole pharmaceutical industry has doubled the human lifespan. Like they've yeah. done amazing things. Right. Um, w which is great. Uh, we just have to make them right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? Um, and 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 really kind of fulfill what the generic industry was, was originally supposed to be, was uh, an equivalent, you know, lower cost, yeah. um, you know, quality way to, to get all the benefits of, of the original discoveries. Yeah. 
But it's human nature. There's always going to be either some purposely nefarious things going on and some of it just cutting corners and cutting them too far. Right. And I think, look, there's many layers to that problem. There's the problem that these uh, uh, bad actors out there and and a fair number of them, uh, the fact that the system itself was engineered in a way that it's easy to cheat. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, right. if if Easy it was uh, if it was a system that didn't enable so many cracks, then yeah. we'd have fewer of them, most likely. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a lot, kind of institutionally, that should change. Right. Um, you know, things like this disillusion that you could use drain cleaner. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. Why is that? That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make sense. Um, and and that that takes some fundamental change. And I think first and foremost, it takes, uh, you know, the humility to say that. There are problems. Yeah, right. 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 Like this, the system isn't perfect. No. Um, you know, I think you know regulators and industry as a whole are are, are uh, working towards the best possible products and systems. Um, you know, on, on average, and and that's great, but it's not perfect. Yeah, it's, and it's far from it. And we have to admit that there are these problems. And now let's start fixing it and working with industry with independent. Uh, yeah. testing and, 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 you know, that ability to have real transparency and real quality assurance. Yeah. Um, and, uh, infuse that to patients is like, I can't imagine anything more important than that. You yeah. Know, of course, pricing is important right. and, and there's all sorts of important things and, you know, what PBMs do and, and, you know, uh, restricting choice and all these kinds of things and clawbacks yeah. and, a lot of problems out there, but safety first. Yeah, safety right? first. Safety first, quality of your health care, and nothing more important than yeah. that. Yeah. I like what you said there. Uh, you said that the legislatures or, or regulators are moving forward and, and want the best for people on average. I think you said that. Was that right? Right. So you got some you got some bad eggs in there, <laughs> but on average, it's in the right direction. Yeah, and, and look, and especially when we, you read a, a book like Bottle of Lies and you get into a lot of <laughs> yeah. the details of the really bad actors. <laughs> yeah. Um, and But on average. Yeah. So not, everybody, average. not everybody's like that, <laughs> but some are. <laughs> David, favorite part of your week, uh, business-wise? Um, hearing from the patients that, that we affect. Mm. Um, Good, you know, cool. We're more and more you know, hearing from, from patients, from doctors – yeah. You know, you know, thank you for creating this company. Um, yeah. you know, how, how can I help? Um, and yeah. and you know, also that feedback. Yeah, exactly. Seeing that feedback like, you know, hey, I was I was on this drug for a long time and had all these problems and, and now I, I everything is is more consistent with my uh, with my symptoms, and I'm just really happy that you guys exist. And, and a lot of just, cool. just happy that somebody's actually checking. Um, yeah. And right. Uh, it, it's it's very rewarding to get that. And you know, for me, you know, that's that's back to your original question of uh, you know what excited me as a kid was you know sciences right. and and all that. Yeah. And, uh, but the entrepreneurship, in addition to the science, where you can actually take these really cool, neat Things like I love laboratories and, and yeah. uh, you know, sp- uh, spectrometry and uh, you yeah. know, solving scientific problems is, is awesome. Uh, but being able to impact people's lives uh, right. and, and improve them and, and uh, you know, make a difference um, is, yeah. is very uh, exciting. Yeah, that's so cool. So many of us kids, you know, learned especially the chemistry and stuff in the in the books. And you'd see some experiments, you know, and mixed vinegar and – baking so oh, that's and those a fun kind one. of things <laughs> but it's cool to really i'm sure it's really cool for you to be able to see things happen and then and then also like you say in people david finally what would you do if somebody came in right now and said you got to leave for three months and no no science you can't do any science you can't do anything with the business you're kind of like on a three-month sabbatical how would you spend that time basically i'd definitely catch up on surfing in san diego <laughs> Surfing in San Diego. Yeah, yeah. Take the whole family down. I grew up in San Diego. Ah, uh, where are you now? Uh, in uh, Yale Science Park in New Haven, Connecticut, is is where Valisher is, and I live in, in there. Okay. Is that due mainly to to your schooling, or or is there a reason to be out there in this kind of a molecular market? 
Yeah, no, I, I came out here for school and, um, you know, there's just a tremendous amount of biotech opportunities here and, and was working gotcha. here and, and kind of gotcha. grew the roots and uh, my, my wife is a native of, of the area and okay. and all, all right. her siblings and you know how it goes with uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. putting down roots and yeah. Connecticut's a great place, but, uh, yeah. but, <laughs> but, but it's not San Diego. Uh, San Diego's hard to compete with, yeah. You'd go surfing in San Diego. Yeah, I, I used to surf a lot. Um, obviously not very good surf in the Long Island Sound. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I do a lot of kayaking out here. Why is the surf bigger on the West Coast versus East Coast? Um, I think that's across the board pretty much, right? Well, so I, it really depends on just where you are on the East Coast. There are some surf okay. spots that are okay. I mean, uh, you know, Connecticut's got Long Island in front of it, so there's really almost no surf. Gotcha. Down south, there's, there's surf and yeah. so and on. And the Pacific is, is pretty good. And, and there's particularly good beaches in San Diego. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, no, I was uh, I, I was actually I was born in Israel, um, and we oh, you moved were. when we were uh, three, uh, when I was three, uh, to San Diego. Were your parents? Did they start as U.S. citizens, or are they from Israel? They became citizens. Yeah, so they're Israeli citizens, and they became citizens of the United States. It's not like they were there for the for the service or anything. They were actually from Israel originally, born and raised in Israel. Um, wow. And yeah, came came here in uh, uh, when I was three years old. And the um, uh, point is that I was, uh, my original name um, when I was born was Yam, which means ocean. Um, no kidding. And so I've always had a, a strong, you know, connection on many levels to, to the water and the ocean. And, and I was a very avid surfer when I was in wow. San Diego and, and kayaker. And, you know, I still live very close to the beach in, in Connecticut and uh, do a lot of kayaking and, and, you know, swimming and those kind of things. Are the waves big enough in San Diego or are you guys or are you always thinking I wish I was in you know Hawaii or something or, or are you satisfied with the waves in San Diego I'm perfectly satisfied with San Diego <laughs> they don't have to be sometimes they're too big for you uh no I enjoy the you get a storm out there and we would go in storms here and there and, and you get some pretty big waves uh, but I, I look I'm not a professional surfer of any by any means um so Perfectly happy with San Diego. I always picture myself like on like you know like in Lake Michigan, and I'd be riding these waves like on my tummy board or something like that. And uh, I would always think it looks so cool. But if someone took a picture of me, it'd be like like when I play football with my brothers. We have our annual Turkey Bowl coming up in a couple of days, and I might like jump for a pass, and I'm picturing myself like looking like I'm in a full out spread like the pros, and I. I'm probably a half inch off the ground, but <laughs> in my mind, I'm in my mind, I'm doing that. So that's how I pictured myself surfing. But you've got some real waves out there. That'd be really cool. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. It's a great place. Wait, so do you get out there and do that occasionally? Then uh, here and there, yeah, when I can find an excuse uh, to get out there. Um, you know, when, when there's a conference out in San Diego, that tends to get high priority on it. my calendar. Yeah, <laughs> my son now, who's like sixteen, one of my sons, but he was like seven he's in the backseat of the car and he said dad when you die can you go anywhere and i'm <laughs> like yeah he's like anywhere i'm like yeah and i'm picturing like he's on this you know moonbeam going to saturn or something like that yeah. he says he says all right i'm going to florida <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, they, they got these planes these days. <laughs> so San Diego, San Diego is pretty close to that. But yeah. uh, all right, David, pleasure to meet you. I'll be watching closely. Thank you. No, thank you very much for having me. I was sitting sitting around and I saw this on um, my phone going through LinkedIn and I, I sent off an email to you right away because it was a really something that grabbed my attention and I think it's going to grab everybody's attention strongly. You guys are going to do great things. No, thank you very much and, and totally agree. You know, these are real problems that we're addressing, I think, in a very yeah. serious way. And, and we're, we're very interested in interacting with the pharmacy community, um, you know, the healthcare systems as, as a whole, because yeah. I think this is just you know, so important for, for patients, right? Uh, that, that we're, that's our, all of our focus in healthcare. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, thanks again for, for the opportunity to go into the story and yeah, uh, uh, yeah gr great to continue con these conversations. My pleasure. Yeah. I look forward to keeping in touch. Absolutely. Thanks again. All right. Thanks, David. Take care.